On the screen there, you can see a question that we need to ask ourselves every time we come to the Bible. This is a theological question that you must do, I must do, all of us must do when you read the Bible. What is it about Jesus, about the Apostle Paul today, and about you that is unique? Now, we all like to imagine that we're unique. There's seven and a half billion of us in the world, and so there's a fairly common universal human experience, but yet we're all unique in God's eyes. And there are things in the Bible that are unique about Jesus, and there are things that are universal. And if we get them wrong, we're likely to make massive errors. Today's passage will deal in part between what is unique about the Apostle Paul and what is universal, and therefore what becomes unique about us as Christians and what is universal. Quite important, I'll give you the easy answer to start with. There is something fundamentally unique about Jesus, isn't there? Only he comes as God in the flesh to die for sin. The Father doesn't die for sin. The Holy Spirit does not die for sin. The Father does not come in human form, nor the Spirit. And so there are individual things that are unique about the Son that we ourselves do not copy because they're not universal. But there are aspects of Jesus's character which are universal. Now, whilst this is a generally bad idea to ask the question, what would Jesus do? Because generally speaking is, what would Jesus ask you to do? Right? Because there's lots of things that Jesus can do that I can only dream of doing. And some of those things you might think aren't unique, like miracles, but they're universal. But actually, I think they're more unique than universal. And there are some things which are dead set universal. Love your neighbor. Love the Lord your God. They're universal things that Jesus asks us to copy. But he's not going to ask you to die for your sins. That's only something he can do. Now, what's the importance of this? The importance of this for today's passage is Paul will start talking about himself right up front. And then he'll move to start talking about the Colossians. And he'll move to start talking about us. And so we've got to get it right. What is unique to the ministry of Paul and what is universal? And we'll look at the first topic uh, in a moment as well. If you can bring them up for me in the next slide for me, Jess. Thank you. So this is the overarching view. I'm going to give you the answer first and then how Paul traces his way through it. And then we'll take a few steps going through each of those points. Although some of them we won't cover very much at all because they're really next week when Paul applies the agony and loving and proclaiming to the Colossian church. Paul starts off by talking about his suffering. And then he's basically going to be saying that a mature Christian, a person who wants to mature in the Christian faith, will be doing all these things. You will be suffering for the gospel. You'll be serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be proclaiming the gospel. You'll be doing it in agony. You'll be doing it in love. And so by the end, he is really trying to say, if you want to be a Christian who is growing in maturity, you will suffer, you will serve, you will proclaim, you will do it in agony sometimes, you will do it in love, but do it you shall in order to be mature. And the converse, sadly, you will find is true. Those who aren't growing in Christ will want to ditch suffering, they don't want to serve, they will only proclaim when it's good for them to do so. They are not in agony over their brothers and sisters who aren't growing in the Lord, and they don't have enough love for those who aren't members of their own biological family. That's the opposite of Christian maturity that Paul's going to get onto. Now, what's the importance of that unique idea? Well, Paul suffers in a unique way that is different probably than how you're going to suffer. And just because you don't suffer in the same way as he does, doesn't mean you're any less of a Christian. Suffering, though, is pretty universal. But I wonder, when you think of suffering, you've got the same problem that I might have. Suffering or Christian persecution is normally thought of in fairly physical terms. Paul suffered for the gospel. He was almost stoned to death. He almost drowned. He was whipped and flogged. And we think of that as persecution, and that it is. But Paul goes on to talk about a type of suffering that is not so much merely about physical suffering for the gospel, but agony, an emotional, a wrestling of mind, a toil of body that is not just physical, but mind as well. And that is going to be the universal suffering 
You may not have physical suffering in this world, but if you don't have mental anguish or spiritual suffering, then the upshot, according to Paul, potentially you aren't growing as a mature Christian. And we'll get to that in a moment. You can bring the next slide up for me, Jess. So Paul starts off in verse 24, if you have that in front of you. If you don't have one of these books, we've been using these books for the last couple of weeks. They basically have the ESV text. I have found ones now that do have the NIV text. So we will go back to those in the new year at various times where we think these books will be advantageous. And I'll give you the heads up for that. And on the right-hand side, uh, my left-hand side here, I type my notes in and you can type notes in as you go as well. And at the bottom of the page, it says, now I rejoice in my sufferings. Now, if you're not a Christian here today, that should seem like the stupidest idea you've ever heard of. How many of you rejoice in your sufferings? If you rejoice in your sufferings, you've got problems. If I come off a motorbike and I was in hospital in and out for about a year, I did not rejoice. I still remember the next day after the adrenaline wore off, it was about 48 hours before I had my body put back together uh, by uh, Wagga Base Hospital. They did a great job. But I remember that day, I was not rejoicing in suffering. To rejoice in suffering means you're a masochist. You've got problems. So has Paul got problems? You see, there is something unique about the Christian understanding of suffering that means you can be joyous. And it's linked to the second part of that verse. For your sake. Well, that doesn't answer it because I know mothers can have some sort of joy in suffering during childbirth, but if you could avoid that, you may want to do so. And if men had children, there wouldn't be any children, would there? So you don't just rejoice in suffering, even if it's for somebody else's sake. There has to be a good reason. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. So this is part now of Paul's unique ministry. If you bring up the next slide for me, Jess, Paul in Acts chapter 9 was called and commissioned by God on the road to Damascus with a particular ministry to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And he knew, because of what God said, I'm just going to throw my phone back to my children here. Or my wife. The reverb is coming back through the phone. Paul knew this was the reality of his calling, that he, as it says there in verse 15 and 16, is going to suffer much for the kingdom of God for the sake of Jesus Christ. So the only suffering in this world that is good suffering is the suffering that is the result of persecution for preaching the gospel. That is, you tell people the gospel and they hate your guts or they ignore you or, in Paul's case sometimes, threw a rock at him or whipped him that type of suffering he rejoices in because it happened because he proclaimed Christ. The Apostle James and Paul both say, if you suffer because you're an idiot, I've done lots of suffering in this life. All of it self-inflicted. And sometimes inflicted by others. But you don't rejoice in that suffering when others hurt you or when you hurt yourself. That's not something to be rejoicing in. That's something that's a sign of a broken world. It's a sign of others' sinfulness. So Paul rejoices only in suffering when it's the response of others' bad reaction to the gospel because he was faithful, you see. If you're soft, if you give in, if you refuse to suffer, you refuse to serve, refuse to proclaim the gospel, Paul says in Timothy, guess what? Nobody will persecute you. Nobody will say anything bad about you. Nobody will know you're a Christian and nobody will care. And Paul says, that's not good. Yes, suffering may be the result, but you didn't cause the suffering, you preached the gospel. And so he knows that his particular call is going to lead him to suffering lots. If you bring up the next slide for me, Jess, he goes on to verse 25 to speak about his motivation. And he talks about it from the idea of service in beginning in 25, in the end of that section in 25, 29. Let me read 25. He says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God. That's from Acts 9, that calling of the Apostle Paul. That was given to me for you. He's never met the Colossians. 
He gave the gospel to Epaphras, who now has taken it back to Colossae, and people have been converted. And Paul says, that is part of my ministry because I received this call to preach the gospel to you. You can see it there, to make the word of God fully known. Now, we haven't yet moved from what is unique to Paul to what is maybe universal to us. Are we part of this ministry of Paul? Well, not yet we're not, because it doesn't say. But that's Paul's mission. And in verse 29, it gives us more about his endeavor. For this I toil, that's to make the word of God known, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. So Paul suffers because he preaches the gospel. And his suffering is both mental and physical, and sometimes at the same time. But how much is that going to be true for you? Because I'm going to suspect not many of you here have suffered physically. And you may be thinking that that means I haven't been persecuted. And you may read other parts of scripture which says, those who aren't being persecuted, it's probably because you're not a Christian. Because your softness of serving, of proclamation, of trying to avoid suffering means that when push comes to shove, you're happy to be pushed into silence. And Paul says, there's another type of suffering that may come your way, or should come your way, I should say, even if it's not physical persecution, physical suffering. And we'll get onto that as well. But you can see right here, Paul is saying his aim in life is to serve people, to serve others for you, for the church. That's his aim. So now we're going to look at how much of this do we now take on board ourselves? You bring up the next slide for me, Jess. These are the middle verses, as well as verse 25, that were in, one, in Colossians 1, verses 25 through there to verse 28. You already heard in verse 25 the call of Paul to be a steward for the gospel. Verse 26, he says, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. There's only one type of saints. It's a lower case S, saints. A saint is a person who's holy. What's a holy person? One who is separated by God from sinners to be his people. That's a holy person, to be separate. So what is, remember, unique about Christians and universal? Well, universal, we're all human. We all live, we breathe, we die. But the only thing that is unique about Christians is you've been made a saint by Jesus Christ. You've been called out, or to use the words from Colossians 1, 21 to 23. You were alienated from God, the universal human experience. But a Christian is unique in that you have the hope of glory, Christ in you, by virtue of him dying for your sin and you accepting what he has done for you. That now makes you unique, not by virtue of your goodness, but by virtue of his blessed brilliance and amazing love. That's the mystery that was hidden for ages. No one wrote a treatise, even in the Old Testament, who outlined all the fulfillment passages of the gospel and saw them all going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. When Jesus was born, everyone didn't go, yes, that's the Messiah. They had to be told by God, like Mary and Joseph. Jesus revealed the character of God. This mystery was hidden and revealed by the power of the Spirit, even to us now, 2,000 years this side of the cross. Verse 27, to them, that's to you, and certainly to the saints here, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. What is this mystery? Christ in you. So the mystery is that God did not come and put his spirit on you like Samson, David, Solomon, or Saul, who lost it. The Spirit does not come upon us. It doesn't rain down on us. It lives in us. Big difference. Christ is in us 24-7 permanently. Therefore, you have the hope of glory permanently. And it leads to, it says in the next verse, full assurance. God's never going to leave you in Christ. Never will he forsake you because he's living in you. That's the hope of glory. Now, verse 28 is the first time now where Paul starts to transfer from his own ministry experience to you, to the Colossians. Him, 
we proclaim, not I proclaim, him we proclaim. So you can see the logic now, hopefully, from Paul. He says, I've had an experience of suffering. It's unique to me, but the gospel can result in suffering for anybody. But my experience of suffering will be different from yours and different from yours. You don't have to be cut off at the head here to be a Christian martyr. We all can have different experiences of suffering and different experiences of serving, different experiences of proclaiming, but you proclaim the same Christ. My experience will be different than the first century Colossian Christians and the 24th century Christians if Jesus hasn't returned. But we'll be proclaiming the same message, which is Christ is that mystery that has been revealed. What are you doing? Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. And the result and purpose you want is right at the end there in verse 28. What do you want to see happen? Present everyone, see it says, mature in Christ. That's Paul's aim. Paul's aim is initially conversion, of course. But one of the mistakes we make in the history of the church is we think the job is done once you're saved. Good, you're saved from hell. Tick that box. That's the start of the game. The game has now begun for you to revel in and to enjoy and to grow. The aim of life is not to be converted, merely. The aim of life is to grow into maturity in Christ. This side of heaven and then fully realized in glory. That's the aim. And the only way to grow into maturity is to not shirk suffering, to actually start serving and to proclaim when you have an opportunity, both the negative and the positive. Warning everyone surely means in this context, the warning that without Christ, you are still alienated from God, enemies in your mind, hostile, verses 21 to 23, because he's already said it. That's the reality. That's you outside of Christ. And he hates that. He doesn't want it. That'll lead on to the agony in a moment. And the positive, teaching everyone with all wisdom. What is the wisdom? It's those universal truths of Christ about loving the Lord your God with all your heart and then telling you what that means. I'll go on more about that next week. That's the next slide for us, Jess, because he speaks more about that from 2.6 onwards. For me, this is one of the main uh, learnings I've done this week uh, from this passage. Because you may be like me, my homepage at the moment is Operation World. So you click on a web browser and Operation World comes up as my uh, homepage. And today, for example, I had Trinidad and Tobago. If you ever want to start the morning with something that's good, not you focused, and you click on your browser, have something like persecution.org, Voice of the Martyrs, Operation World come up. They give you prayer points in other countries, other people groups, and you are focused, therefore, not on self, but on others. And this is where Paul goes on to in these verses that you see here. Now, the word agony is in our text in chapter 2, verse 1, with the idea of struggling. Paul uses uh, physical labouring metaphors throughout this text, and the idea here is of a wrestle. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Not all persecution, not all anguish is physical. A lot of it is emotional, it's mental. And so Paul now sees that as you become more mature in Christ, you will face more agony, more struggle for other people. And I suspect, and I know for certain that a lot of you know this reality, that you've been in agony over your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your children, grandchildren, who do not trust Jesus. And sometimes it's easier to put that agony in the back of your mind and not let it dwell because the pain is too great. Paul wants to say, don't do that. It is not a stoic gospel we believe in. That is to keep strong and not be in agony over the saints who are suffering or the sinners who refuse to repent. No, be in agony. The Apostle Paul in Romans says, I would rather be dead if it led to my brethren being converted by Christ. I'd rather almost be a non-believer, he says, if my brethren were convicted by the Lord Jesus. That's how much he agonizes over those who aren't saved. He is in agony here. He is struggling in prayer, in anguish, over a people he's never met. Never seen them. Doesn't know them from a bar of soap. Doesn't know them at all. 
And he says, I agonize over you, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together, the Laodiceans who about 10 k's down the road and the church in Colossae. Wouldn't it be awesome that you guys are knit together in so much love? I know it can be hard because I know that there'll be some of you here right now who have led someone to the Lord. You preached the gospel to them. And then 10 years later, when suffering came their way, they left. And it crushed your heart to see your son, daughter, father, mother, work colleague, who you invested time in, just give up on the faith. And you think, is that agony worth it? Do I want to put myself through that pain? Can you imagine how often Paul faced the persecution or suffering of a brother who heard the gospel saying, no thanks. His own family, no evidence that they became believers, we don't know. Or the amount of times that a church he led to the Lord, we read over it so quickly. After he leaves, wolves come in and they lead that church astray, all that work undone. And he writes back to them, he says, who's bewitched you? Why? Read the letter to the Galatians, just up the road. Galatians is like saying New South Wales to, and Colossae is a city and Galatians a, a province. Who's bewitched you? That's a pain. He could have easily said, look, I've had enough of you blokes. You're hopeless. I'm going to lance you off. I'm going to cut you off at the neck. I'm sick and tired of you. You're all a bunch of false teachers anyway. Get me out with you. But no. He says, I'm going to come back. I want to be back with you guys. Because he's in agony. Not just over work ruined, but over hearts led astray. And this is where he goes in our text, if you have it in front of you, in verse four that we'll see in a moment verse two continues on with the purpose for all this agonizing love that you have even for people you've never met let alone for brothers and sisters in the lord who are a part of your own church and family that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love if you've got the esv there it'll say knit the niv will say unity same idea but the knit metaphor there is is like that sewing idea the stitching of cloths together the laodicean people have nothing in common with the colossian people the 10 k's up the road and they've been knit together by jesus christ hence the term in the gospels brothers sisters you've been knit together by this knowledge about the mystery being revealed to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. That's what knits us together. We're not knit together like a rotary club or like a sporting group. We're knit together by Christ. And so people who you have no natural affinity with, you have no personality desires that are the same, no interests bar Christ. That trumps all, whether it's biology, or interest or hobby that knits us together and we'll go on to some of the reasons why this is important but he outlines one in verse four which i'll get you to bring up in the next slide for us jess the purpose which he explain, expands next week so i only touch on it this is the purpose of why it's good to be united and knit together with other believers i say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments let me ask this question and see if you can switch it in your mind how it works. Paul is basically saying, I want you to be knit together so that if you hear false truth, you recognize it as such. That's what he's saying. And the question is, what's that got to do with being knit together with a church you've never heard of or never seen? Well, this is how it can work. Let's say next week I stand up and I start saying, guess what? From Colossians 2 verses 6 and onwards, I've learnt that there are actually four gods. And you might go, really? How did you come to that conclusion? Now, if you're an immature Christian, hardly read the word of God, and I say that, you might either believe me because I've got a degree in such... Uh, See, Dawn can help me with that right now. 
<laughs> Thanks, Dawn. Dawn would give me the comeuppance. She would know there's not four gods. She would know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the way that a person would know that is because they've grown in maturity. Maturity of faith. So if the Laodicean Christians start standing up and saying, look, you can have a bit of Jesus, a bit of paganism, a bit of Judaism. There's one God over all the world. Just put it in the mix of boil it up and call it Christianity. The Colossians go, "Uh uh-uh. We might have to go down there and love our brothers and tell them the truth because they're being led astray. So the more mature you are in the faith, the more able you are to both witness error, see it for what it truly is, and help hopefully the brothers and sisters out before they get too, down, too far down the garden path. But more about that next week. Just bring the last slide up for me, Jess. Let me summarise this. If you want to do something this week, read Colossians 2 verses 6 through to the end of the chapter. It'll start to flesh out some of the plausible arguments that the Colossians are starting to be swayed by. And you can probably see them, and then you may start to think this week, what are the plausible arguments against Christianity that you're likely to want to believe in? Because it makes your suffering easier, less. It makes serving less needful. You don't have to proclaim the gospel as much. So I suspect one of the ones in Colossae would have been, from the pagans, all faiths are the same. There's one God. No, there are thousands of gods. They're everywhere. You have your God, you have your God, you have your God, but there's only one God above them all. Jesus might be the God of Israel, and you can choose him if you like, but can I choose a God that has less suffering attached to it? Maybe more blessings or something. Less of this nasty business. Less proclaiming. Less serving. Well, at least you guys, anyway. Serve myself. I'll choose that God, because they all get to the same end. It might be one path. That's the Colossians from the pagan background. From the Jewish background, it would be, what are the odds that some dude who you heard a story about, from a person who heard a story about, from a person who heard a story about, about a bloke, you know, 30 odd years ago, who died on a cross, which is, you know, shameful according to Jews, and got resurrected from the dead. And he says he's God. What are the odds of that, you reckon? So the Jews come in and say, we've got the Old Testament. What book you got? At this stage, none. We've got the word of God. What do you got? A story that you heard from someone who heard it from someone about some dude who died on a cross in a a joint called Jerusalem who's now been going to be sacked by some Roman government in 66 AD around the time this was written. And you want to say that guy's God? Really? You go with that. Or go with God's revelation too in the Old Testament through Abraham, through Moses, through David. We know them. And you just might be inclined to say, hmm, maybe they're right. Maybe it has been whispers I've heard. It does seem quite an impressive book, the Old Testament. So this week, if you want to read something, read verses 6 onwards and think to yourself, what plausible arguments are you likely to be swayed by that would make you deny the uniqueness of Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour? Because that's what we're going to focus on next week. Just to summarise to end. A mature Christian does all those things in their own unique way. You will suffer. It may not be physical, but it will be emotional. It will be an agonizing suffering. Now, the gospel is not always bad news because many people come to faith. You're all sitting here. Many people in your family have come to faith. You rejoice when they come to faith and you give thanks. The hope of glory. And you serve hoping that comes true. You proclaim the gospel. And you do it as you commit not merely words, but your life to other people. Because you love Christ and want to love them. So a Christian who wants to become mature does that. Maturity comes by suffering, serving, proclaiming, agonizing, and loving. That's the way Paul did it. That's the way we do it too. Now I'm going to pray.